All right, I see. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Feldner. I'm Dean of the Dietrich College of Communication, and I always have the privilege of introducing all of the great programming we do here in the college. We're really proud to host any number of lectures in the Pete um, and Bonnie Axtelm lectures. One that's um, really important to us has been going on for over a quarter century, and it brings together this understanding that as our students are here learning and doing the work, our faculty are researching it, connecting with folks who are in the industry doing the work and have a perspective that follow in the legacy that was created by Pete and Bonnie and their connections here to Marquette. Um, and we are grateful to be joined today by Nancy Axelm, who has really helped carry on that um, legacy, and she joins us here today. So welcome, Nancy. And thanks for your support. Um, she and Megan, who is Pete's daughter, Matt Brown, Steve Axelm, along with Norby Williamson at ESPN, have really helped us to continue to bring really important conversations to get a uh, behind the scenes um, glimpse and some perspective from highly talented um, individuals. Bonnie herself was a highly accomplished executive. She was a very early female leader in the ranks, and she worked in marketing and public affairs for the 3M Corporation. And she was really a pioneer for a lot of the things we think about with our students today about how to make their way through communication in the corporate workplace. Pete, for those of you who don't know, was a, one of the preeminent sports journalists in the United States. He was really a visionary and an advocate for women in journalism. So he was one of the first print joint journalists to jump over to TV, covering lots of sports. And so rather than listening to me talk about his background, we do have a short video we like to show at the beginning so you understand the legacy that we are um, recognizing with this lecture. Pete Axtell was a columnist, television sports commentator, and author like no other. Working for Sports Illustrated, Newsweek, ESPN, and NBC, Pete turned sports reporting into something enlightening, insightful, and creative. Let's turn over to Pete Axtell now. Let's go back to the glory of the Thanksgiving Day. He went with the Lions, and that proved true. Yes, Bob, my proudest pick of the year, and I've got to keep the pressure on. You don't know pressure. Ax, as he was called, was a New Yorker at heart, but he created an unwavering bond with Marquette's own Al McGuire while researching his book, The City Game, considered the best description of street basketball played in New York City during the 60s and 70s. Pete Axthelm used his gift in writing to be the difference in the world of sports journalism. And his legacy continues to have an impact on Marquette students today through the generous support of the Axthelm family. The Pete and Bonnie Axthelm Memorial Scholarship was established in 1994 to pay tribute to the lives of Pete and his sister Bonnie, a notable marketing executive in her own right. Each year, this program awards scholarships to outstanding Diedrich College students with an expressed interest in pursuing a career in sports journalism. And it brings to campus notable sports journalists who inform, inspire, and entertain in the tradition of the great Pete Axtell. As you saw, um, the Axum lecture has supported many of our students, and we've had over 40 scholarship winners, and we're really grateful to Nancy and the Axum Foundation for making that possible. And I, if I've learned anything in this job is nobody really wants to hear from me, they'd rather hear from our students because they're the ones who are really, you know, the work that we do. And so I'm really pleased and excited to introduce our 2022 Axum Scholarship recipients, Andrew Muzu and Tim Latow, both seniors in the, or sorry, juniors, I just elevate, soon to be seniors, rising seniors in the College of Communication. Andrew is a junior. He's majoring in journalism and minoring in digital media. He serves as the general meet, uh, manager for Marquette University Television. And next year, we are very proud to share that he'll be the executive director of The Wire. He really credits his early achievements and accomplishments um, before Marquette and here to his foundation of faith, love, and inspiration. And he's really grateful to the Marquette Wire and all the opportunity he's been able to have since they, we put a camera in his hands probably on day one. Tim is also a junior, and he is double majoring in journalism and digital media, and he's currently the news producer for Marquette University Television. 
He has a really unique show on Marquette Radio where he covers horse racing and motorsports. And he really looks forward to working at The Wire every day because of all the equipment and all the facilities and the ways that he can be inspired um, by all of his coworkers. So we're really grateful to have them today and they will be our host and coordinator. So congratulations and welcome to Andrew and Tim. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Feldner. And you know, overall, I just want to say that I'm, I'm so grateful and I thank God for, for these opportunities. And I know Tim and I are going to be talking a lot about that uh, fairly soon. But um, I also want to thank, you know, Nancy and the rest of the XM family uh, for this special gift and for the inspiration, you know, that, that Pete and Bonnie have brought us all. You know, as um, Dean Felder mentioned in, in the intro, which was a very lovely intro, we are not seniors. Don't don't age us that that much, uh, Dr. Felder. But, um, you know, I, I strive off of inspiration and I'm really inspired by, you know, the Exxon family and then my community around me. Um, I thank Dean Felder. I thank uh, faculty and staff for, you know, helping put together these type of events um, while also, you know, inspiring students like Tim and me to continue to put our best foot forward. Um, whether that's in the College of Com or not. And, you know, I'd be a fool to, to not mention, again, the Market Wire um, for all the experiences that I've been able to have here and the great people that I've been able to meet. And I can go on and on about it, and I know we don't have that time, but, uh, you know, overall, I'm, I'm very excited to be highlighting sports journalism tonight, um, and, I'm in, and I'm excited to be inspired uh, by more students and professionals in the industry. Tim? Yeah, certainly. Thank you, uh, Dean Feldner and all the other faculty and staff who have uh, been working to make this lecture possible, um, as well as the uh, scholarship too, um, and, and the Axelm Family Trust. Um, it's an incredible honor to uh, have been selected as a winner. Um, and, and, you know, thank you to Nancy and the rest of the Axelm fam family for this, um, you know, honorable and generous scholarship. Um, we're certainly very appreciative of, of your support and um, for all the Deidre College of Communication students and um, that's certainly something that we're uh, striving for every day to display that leadership and um, excellence that uh, really defined Bonnie and Pete in their respective fields. And um, I'm, uh, you know, happy that, you know, all of my colleagues get the wonderful opportunities that they do uh, within the College of Communication to uh, learn and grow um, in so many ways every day. And uh, like Dean Feldner said, uh, be inspired by, by each other. And so I know we would definitely love to highlight uh, Beaumont before he speaks. So um, I would definitely begin if uh, if there was ever like a traditional route to being a sports writer, uh, TV and radio host and many other roles alike in today's world. I guess some people would say that Bomani uh, could be untraditional because, you know, attending uh, a well-known HBCU first represent um, historically black college or university in Clark, Atlanta um, for his undergrad. Jones began his journey majoring in economics. He then earned a master's in economics, politics and business and eventually even pushing uh, for a doctorate in economics. Um, but, you know, according to his website, and I know Shaquille O'Neal talks about it a lot. If you don't know him, search him up, Google him. According to his website, uh, Bomani's writing did not necessarily start in sports, uh, but in music and pop culture. And and he was likely, um, he's going to likely explain all that in his lecture. So stay tuned for that. Um, but the door did open to enter into the world of ESPN, and he didn't look back. And Bomani became a columnist uh, for the network soon after. With ESPN, Jones um, has been heavily involved with all things broadcast and, um, you know, from hosting radio shows and even launching his own, Jones' personality shined over the airways. Many of us have seen Jones appear on shows such as Outside the Lines, Around the Horn, at which one point he won three consecutive episodial debates uh, on, on that show. <laughs> Um, and Highly Questionable, which is an, a hilarious television show. Check that out, among others. And last year, Jones began his new show, Game Theory with Bomani Jones on HBO. And he also anchors his own podcast titled The Right Time with Bomani Jones. And, you know, one of the most interesting feats um, of Jones's career that I would like to highlight um, before he speaks here is that he was ranked number 17 on the Roots 100 Most Influential African Americans list in 2016. So that alone speaks for himself. Uh, but, you know, perfectly put in his website, his influence and contributions to media 
continue to inspire young gifted professionals in the community. So I'm gonna throw it to Tim. Yeah, and uh, like Andrew was saying, Bomani will speak about his career and topics um, of his choosing, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience for the last uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, Andrew and I will call on those um, who have raised their hands or uh, uh, read the questions typed in the chat. So uh, now it is a great privilege to turn it over to the incredible Bomani Jones. All right, fellas, I appreciate you, and I'm looking forward to conversing with you a little bit, as that was how I thought this was going to go. So I'm going to give a little of this and a little of that. Um, thank you. First of all, obviously, thank uh, Marquette University, the School of Communications, for having me. I appreciate this. Also, thank you to uh, Norby Williamson, who reached out to me about doing this, and I learned in the process that he was he produced Pete Axel at ESPN. And for those of you who are not of age, and understandably, if you are a student, you would not, too, have remembered his work. Um, Chris Berman always says that, like, if they're going to put anything on his tombstone, it's going to be he hosted NFL primetime. Like, NFL primetime is probably the best show that the network has ever done. <clears throat> and Pete Axelm helped anchor that in a way where he had a very similar role to what Peter Gammons had, which was legitimizing the idea of working on television if you were a working print journalist who just looked at TV as being something completely lesser. But as the medium was growing, Pete was somebody that helped legitimize it and make it to where somebody like me could be on television and taken seriously at the same time, um, which was not always the case in dealing with sports. So I want to thank everybody for having me. And I had been thinking to myself as this was kind of approaching, just trying to figure out like what there is to talk about or women there's always a zillion things to talk about but like what was the thing that i really wanted to you know get into and raise questions about and i guess a few stories that have come up recently made me think this and i think it's maybe like in the broader context of kind of what i see going on specifically in the country though i guess you could say generally in the world and the question kind of comes down to like so what exactly do we believe in and i think that people Think of the idea of belief and believing in things, again, a strictly spiritual concept, but by and large, there are ideas that all of us have generally believed in, or at least had an expectation that you are to believe in. So, for example, being um, a citizen and or native of the United States, like there's an expectation, like the Godfather line, like I believe in America, right, and the idea and the hope that it gives and that there are rules and laws in place and structures and a constitution that has this one amendment that different makes this country different from everywhere else that puts you in a place to where it's something that you believe in or you believe in your country because you believe in the idea of the prosperity that it provides the opportunity for you to achieve and so people look in as you look at a lot of the optimism they have like we did a interview um yesterday with somebody for um game theory and he's a native New Yorker and he gets in and just talking about like New York City. And when you talk to guys that are like 50 years old, it's very interesting to hear them that are from here to talk about New York because they view New York in the context of possibility. Right. So like we're sitting in this apartment, I mean, this uh, hotel room on the Lower East Side and you can see like the Freedom Tower and you can look and he just sits out the window and he's like, look, up there's the greatest basketball players ever down here is the money. If you want to get rich, you can go get it here. You can just see it like brim in him just his belief in the idea of New York, right? Like a post 9-11 New York lands with people differently. And even he talked about how the energy of the city was different. But when you talk to people who are from New York, it gives them an access and a proximity to so many different things that if you are ambitious and you are a type to go get what you want, this place will make you believe it's possible because why isn't it possible? It's just three blocks away, right? It's just a mile this way. It's just a mile that way. And for those of us who are not from New York, those people can often be very, very annoying because all they ever wanted to tell you about is how everything was so much better in New York. Like the Onion once did a fantastic thing when Cardinal O'Connor died and said that Cardinal O'Connor got to heaven and everybody was already tired of him saying how much better New York was. Like this is, you know, th this this is kind of what the city brings out. But I find that like as I get older and as I was talking to this guy yesterday, I saw the charm in it in a different way, right? Like when people do that to you from out of town, it feels like they just try to put down where you are. When you hear from people that are from it and they're in it and while they're there, you see the enthusiasm that comes with the notion of possibility. And I've been thinking about sports and I think that part of what makes sports so attractive to so many people is a concept of belief. And I don't just simply mean 
the belief that one day your team is going to win it, right? Anything like that. Um, um, speaking at a Midwestern school, I'm guessing one or two of y'all might be from Ohio. Y'all been trying to believe in stuff for so long and it just don't never pay off when it comes to your sports. It's a really unfortunate situation, but you keep on doing it, right? And you keep, and people talk about belief um, in that way, but that's not really where I'm going. It's really in the belief in what good sports can do and the belief that sports at their best can be a reflection of the positivity that we hope to see in society. So let's think about the idea that just about every country invests whatever it can in sports. And if you have some athletic competition in your country, the president of that country is coming to the big ones. He, he or she wants to be seen and associated with this unifying force, but also a force that is incredible for projection of values. And so when you think about when people talk about what makes sports great and the values that you learn, like the idea of the virtue of sacrifice, for example, the priest, the virtue of hard work, uh, just the idea and the notion of teamwork, right? Because most people are playing team sports, not individual ones. Like all of those things come together. And so if you run some major institution that's got people under it, of course you're going to want to use sports. You can always use sports analogies to try to push people toward a common goal. And so every society, there isn't a single one that looks at its people and says, it's every man for himself. Now, are there countries where it is, in fact, every man for himself? Oh, yeah. They're not even really that hard to find, but they're not going to tell you that right? Like the idea is that if we can all put in for each other collectively, we will wind up being better. And that is the message that you're going to hear in sports at every turn. And even if you're talking about something individual with sports, it's going to be but still about the idea of sacrifice, the idea that the hard work will ultimately pay off. It's a transferable lesson that I think works very well in a bunch of places. For example, when uh, we were getting ready for this, I was talking to Tim and I was talking to Andrew and just talking about like what the workload is to do this kind of job. And the bottom line is, it's like buying concert tickets, right? If everybody wants to go to that concert and you want tickets, you might have to camp out. It might be 35 degrees. You might have to lay on the ground in a sleeping bag. Like they don't really have a set of, you know, they got the apps and everything where you don't have to do that, but you get my point. The people who want it the most are going to grind harder to get it. And unless you are just some sort of magical talent that doesn't have to hard work, work hard to get it, then you probably going to have to go lay down on the ground in order to make it happen. And you only do that, though, if you believe that there's going to be tickets waiting on you. You only do these things if you legitimately believe that all of this stuff is set up in such a way that you have an actual chance to succeed. And America's greatest notion that we have sold, and for a lot of people has largely been true, has been the idea that you got a shot. That's what it is. And something that can be a little disappointing, I think, and I think that if you think about a lot of the things that we see in the news, some of which you might even find to be personally offensive in terms of the behaviors and the things that a lot of people say is, I feel like I look around and I see in a lot of people of varying backgrounds an absence of belief. Like what exactly is there to believe in? And we see people more than ever clinging to tribalistic notions, clinging to some kind of outright hatefulness and clinging to self, right? And the belief that you, one person, are the one that has the answers and nobody else is telling the truth and everything else, right? Like we see a lot of that and I believe that that's what comes up in a in the absence of something to believe in or people believing that there's something to believe in. In that absence, I believe, is when we see so many people do so many of these things and we see so many detrimental behaviors from people who no longer believe that they have anything to believe in. And so that's broad. But how does that relate to sports, right? Are sports in 2022 projecting something that either inspires or reinforces belief? That is the question that I ask. And when thinking about that in this 
context that I wish to present it. We have to think about the modern media environment. We have to think about where we stand now and how much we know about just about everything, right? The internet and all the technology has given us an uncommon access to information, which after a point probably stopped being a good thing. Like I think that there was a tipping point, there was an inflection point where it was like, yo, I think if we knew less, we'd probably be a little bit happier, right? But we have all this information. And I remember I read a book about, eh, it wasn't 15, it was well over a decade ago. It's called The Facebook Effect. It's one of the early books about Facebook and very clearly seemed to have the authorization of Mark Zuckerberg. Like it didn't have the tone of the social network stuff, right? It was much more kind and toward the vision of what Zuckerberg believed that Facebook could be. And his thought, at least as presented in the book, was that if I have this platform and everybody's got to use their actual name and use their face and put their name on it, we will encourage good behavior, not bad behavior, because there will be the accountability of people knowing who you are. But the other belief was that this increase in information would create a transparency that would enforce a moral good and therefore make the world a better place. Then, of course, people stopped using their actual faces and names on stuff, and then everything went to hell, right? But that was the idea, is that we will have transparency with more of this sharing. And some of y'all might actually need to, like, step behind the shade a little bit. I don't need to see into your house. I don't need to see what it is that you're doing. But we now see into all of these houses. We see how business is done by so many entities in sports. And there was a time where at the very least it felt, even if just in the name of lip service, these entities needed to project a certain morality and do certain things in order to show the society that it supported the values that the society itself then supported. I feel like we find that many of these things happen and the sporting entities are not viewing it in the context of what they need to represent, but more so the individual members thinking in the context of what it is that they need to protect. So I will give you an example on that. When Donald Sterling got caught talking bad about Magic Johnson and lost his basketball team for it, I actually argued that he should not lose his team and my argument against him losing his team was pretty simple it was that he's done actually destructive racist things for decades that nobody had a problem with and now all of a sudden he says something that was impolite and everybody wants to jump on it like we hustling backwards right now that's not really how these things work that's how i see it but i'll never forget mark cuban shortly after lined something up with some magazine in texas and did a sit down and he was arguing against um Sterling losing his team, but his logic was clearly different than mine. His logic was that all of us have some bad things that we think from time to time and we don't want to get fired for them. And I was like, hey, buddy, uh, what you really talking about here? Well, what we find out a few years later, Mark Cuban's got a toxic workplace culture in his franchise, but they wind up having to fire people and all of this stuff. Rather than enforce a morality on Sterling, and even if I believe they were going about it the wrong way, the public statement they were making was that they were enforcing a morality upon him. Rather than enforce a morality upon him, the decision seemed to be from Cuban to look out for self in case it ever spun around to him. Not, yo, maybe I should just go clean these things up in my office. It was like, no, what if they find out about me? That's how it looks. I can't say definitively that's what he's doing, but I think you see what I see, and I don't think that that's an unreasonable conclusion for somebody to draw. At the very least, it ain't a bad hypothesis to throw out there and then test. I think that we have seen this happen with the Washington football team, with their owner and everything. That, well, I guess they're the commanders. They have a team. They have a name now. My bad. Uh, we've seen this with the commanders and everything that has swirled around them, and we've seen no action taken by the league. In fact, you saw it at one point where it looked like People were trying to buy up Daniel Snyder's shares, and in the end, he wound up buying them all himself and now owns the team 100%. There's been no enforcement against him. The league that has always decided it was going to enforce upon players in the times of their misconduct cannot enforce upon those who one would think are the most responsible for reflecting the positive values that you claim that sports then 
uphold. You look up and you see the case with Deshaun Watson. And while I'm willing to entertain the possibility that there's still some information we may not know, you know, this is still an investigation that's going on. But the fact there's an investigation that's still going on is my point. There's an investigation going on of Deshaun Watson, and it is not settled. And somebody who's willing to guarantee him $280 million. The person who guaranteed him the $280 million is an owner who once had to leave his corporate offices in Tennessee to go hole up in the offices with the Cleveland Browns because the feds raided the joint and he couldn't get back in there because he was accused basically of stealing from truck drivers. Um, Jimmy Haslam, the owner of the team, ultimately didn't have to pay any serious penalty, but there's no question that the company that he runs engaged in this behavior. So what about that is inspiring belief? Like, what about that is making you believe, forget about like inspiring belief in these grand concepts, right? Or like inspiring you to dream. How about just making you think you got to act right, right? Or that there's a basic level of behavior, uh, decorum within behavior that we're supposed to have. And that these leagues that are supposed to project all that is good can't even project that, can't even project those things. And so when you think about all that, and you put it all together and you think about it like in the context of all the money that's swirling and the role that capitalism has played in bringing sports to where they are and everybody's so driven by growth and everything else, when most of us got into this in the first place because it was fun. What is sports really giving you to believe in? Now, sports has also given us at points the belief in the idea of basically if you're really good at this, you're going to make it. If you're really talented, you're going to make it because talent is in short supply and talent to this day still remains the most important thing you can have if you want to be an athlete. But I can see how if you wouldn't think so, if you look around and the kids that got the money could put money on this coach and put money on this train and put money on this camp, put money on everything else. And you can't. There's some sports that you're just going to wind up being boxed out of. Or even the ones that you don't wind up being boxed out of it, I can see why you would ultimately believe that you had been. Just because of the ways that all of these things go and they all come together. And I look at it and it just makes me wonder and look toward really journalists in this. It looked like, and the reason why I think that, you know, what I wish to share with you now and the message that I'm giving is I think so important is that it is the job of the journalist to enforce the measures that create belief. It is the job of the journalist to recognize the hypocrisies and the failures of these institutions and bring them to light. And if you bring them to light and people don't notice it at first, then your job is to keep on coming back and doing it until they see it. If we're talking about something that is legitimately important. It's gotten harder and harder for journalists to do that because the resources that are invested into that industry are just not there in the ways that they used to be. And the money of it matters, right? It's hard to pay somebody to go deep into this stuff, especially in the internet era where doing longer form content just isn't as financially beneficial for companies as it may have been in magazine days, for example. Like it just doesn't pay for them to do that. And so we're saying that they have to do it out of some measure of responsibility, but the responsibility of the corporation or the profit um, minded entity is just to make money. Like that's what the gig is and that's what the job is. What's gonna have to drive this in the future, given all that is gonna be the passion of the people behind it. It's going to be the people who get into it because they believe that there is a need for the world that they cover to be a bit more just and to call attention to it and to bring it out. And that really becomes what's important for all the students that are listening to this right now is ask yourself, why are you like, why, especially if you want to do it in sports, why do you want to do this? Because I'll tell you, getting to go to games and sit in the good seats and all that stuff is cool, man, but this job's a grind. Like if, if you're not going to have, I think, some greater, I don't even want to say mission because that feels too dramatic, but if you don't really have like an ethos in this, I don't know if this is what you want to do, or I don't even know if this is the job that necessarily needs you, but I do know this. You probably got into this because on some level you believed in it. 
there's something about it that you believed in. There's something about sports. Like it's one thing to just be like, I want to watch them. It's another thing that like, I want to work in it. I want to make this my life. It's got to be something fundamental that you believe in about it. And that's something worth for yourself exploring and thinking about how to build upon and then questioning whether or not what you see actually does that. And in, in the incredibly powerful position of being a, me a member of the media, what you can do to get us to that place. Now, I'll tell you a story. Um, this was I guess about 15 years ago. I was with my father and we were hanging out. And my father and I, at different points, have had disagreements about the state of the world and where we were going um, as collectively in, as people in this country. And I remember he looked at me and he said something. And he was like, you know, you got to have a side, right? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, ideologically, you got to have something. You got to stand for something in whatever it is that you do. You can't just be like, I'm just going to be out here doing it. Because my argument for him was about stuff. It's like, look, the move is you got to take in these facts and then figure out what the, you know, what you do. And he's like, yeah, you can do that too. But something's got to undergird what it is that you were doing. There has to be some real substance to what it is that you're doing. And this is the time I think in your lives to like figure out what that substance is and what it is that you can contribute. Cause if you just want to get something out of this game, it's going to take a lot more out of you in that same process. Right. So what are you here for? What do you love about this? What do you think about this loves you? And where do you think that what you hope to cover can get better? And don't ever get like disillusioned to the point where you don't believe that you can do something like you can do little stuff. You can even make big stuff happen. I'll tell you a great story about little stuff. So, you know, a couple of years ago, we had the George Floyd situation and all the corporations were like, hey, we have to figure out what to say. Right. And so we got all these like Black Lives Matter posts that came from these companies. They didn't know what to do, man. They were just like, yo, we got to let black people know we cool with them. OK, cool. We're going to do that. And so they sent all this stuff out and Drew Brees wound up like he pressed the autopilot button. They asked him about the national anthem and he gave the same answer he's been given. I believe you should respect the national anthem. Da, da, da. Wrong week, homie. Wrong week. Everybody came down on him, right? His teammates giving him FUs, the whole nine. It was the same thing he'd been saying the whole time. We just wouldn't try to hear it this week. Okay. So I was on Twitter, and I was making a point that, I mean, while it's cool that some of these companies put out their Black Lives Matter statements, let's be real. This isn't necessarily germane to everybody's business, right? Not everybody's selling to people where it matters that you're doing this. And I use, as an example, Wrangler Jeans. And I was just like, look, I went and checked Wrangler Jeans' Twitter account, all this stuff. I was like, look, man, Wrangler ain't putting out no Black Lives Matter statement. And guess what? Ain't But, like, the Black people that are buying Wranglers aren't offended in all likelihood. Like, that's just kind of the demographic game. That's how it goes. I just say this on Twitter. It's no big deal. If I'm lying, I'm flying. The next day, Wrangler put out a, on a black background on their Twitter account there, a Black Lives Matter statement. I was like, dog, I said you didn't have to. I was letting y'all off the hook. Still put that thing out there because somebody's listening, right? That ain't major. That ain't huge. But I did make a corporation put out a public statement without even trying. That's a small scale example of what I'm talking about. People still hear us when we're out here. People still care about what we talk about. And just because it feels or looks at times like the entities that are on top here don't care about the things they say they do, that don't mean they can't be made to. That don't mean they can't be pushed to. Or at the very least, it doesn't mean that you can't reach the people whose opinions they no longer respect. But I think for all of us, it requires that we not allow ourselves to become disillusioned in such a way that we don't believe that what we do matters. That we don't believe that there's a role in importance and sincerity in what we say and that there is no room for us to influence these folks. It takes some courage at some points. And I do think in sports, a lot of people are just so happy to be there that they don't want to push nobody. But we got we can do it. We can use this as a way to reach people, reach people and to do bigger things. And so. My personal journeys, we talk about me going through all these places. 
and all these different things that I've done, I realized in large part that I could reach more people with more points through these mechanisms than I could as a professor or a whole bunch of different ways. I could get them where they were. I also happen to really love sports. So like we always had these two things together. Um, never those, you know, the larger world stuff at the expense of the sports stuff because the sports stuff is actually what the job is, but figuring out how to integrate those ideas into what I was doing. And so you weren't getting cheated out of what you came for, but you did get something a little bit extra. And I look around it and I really think about it. I've been doing this job now for about 20 years. And I look at it and I'm like, nah, I've done something here. I can see influence that I've had on younger people. I can see influence that I've had on discussions. I can see influence that I've had on content. Um, it's been done. It's happened. It can. Like, I know this. Can I change the world by myself? No. Can I make people think about the world a little bit different? Yeah, I know that I can. And I know that it's a function of the job. It's a function of the business. It's the point of the business, in fact, is to influence. It is to disseminate information to people and let them do something with it. But that's the whole point of being here. And so ask yourself, what do you want to do that can make things better from the platforms that will be afforded to you from working in this industry? What do you want to do that can make things better? Because I really do believe that all of us legitimately have some measure of power to be able to do that, right? So how are we going to do it? And that's something I would think also, not just about working in media. I think you obviously got to apply that um, outside of media. But I will say this last part as it relates to that, and I think this is important before I kind of, you know, turn it back over to Andrew and Tim. Make sure that you know how to think about whatever this stuff is because something that's happened in the last 20 years and i am a representative of this is that when the internet came around you had all these sites and they needed content and so the need for content then opened up the pool of who could and could not cover sports having the traditional background in journalism wasn't necessary. And also to be fair, to have the traditional journalism background wasn't ever necessary. You go to newspaper and get a job. That's always been the case that you could figure out how to pull it off. My idol in this industry is the late Ralph Wiley, who started as a copy boy at the Oakland Tribune. Then he convinced them to let him write a story. And then he became one of the greatest writers that's ever lived, right? Like that's always been the case. But what you had though, you had like a lot more lawyers get into the game. A lot of people who were like disillusioned with their jobs that always wanted to talk about sports. And they started talking about sports, and I'm a person that fills in this example, in line with the ways and things that they knew and understood, in line with what they were familiar with. So if you were a lawyer, figured out how to put that background as a lawyer on the road when talking about sports. I am an economist by training. How did I take that thought process and put it into sports? That's what people did. What happened as a result is we wound up, and we have this now, and I firmly believe this, but like maybe the most intelligent, well-rounded group of sports writers that there's ever been. It's there. Like, if you think you're going to really be able to get away with talking about this stuff and only knowing about sports, that ain't going to happen. Like, you need to get out here and make sure that you have a, a way to look at the world, something that gives you the problem solving skills to figure out how to do this. Because our game and industry is always going to try to figure out how to get you to do three jobs at one time. They save money that way. It's always going to be that. It take, a, it take a brain to figure out how to do that stuff, how to put all those things together. And what people want from content also requires more of an integration of lots of ideas. Like how you go cover the NFL if you don't have some understanding of how businesses work, for example, or any sporting entity that like, has a salary cap or any of those things. How are you going to do that without that background? So make sure while you take this time, while you were in school, like make sure you learn how to think about stuff. Not just how to pass these tests, not just how to get by, but you're going to really need to know how to think about stuff. Because the truth is the world ain't really got tests. The world is like one big old long essay question. Right. Every time you think you've gotten all the little bullet points in it. Oh, no, there's more. Right. That's what it is. And you can't float by no essay test without having gotten ready for it, without knowing what to think about. And so I wish you all luck on this big old essay exam uh, that is coming out here. And I think that all of us have the potential to pass it. We just got to put in the grind and do it and actually want to. All right. I will uh, go ahead and. I guess uh, you you two have they believe had some questions that we can go to before we get to the peoples. Yeah, I see some uh, applause. So thank you so much, uh, Bamani, for that. 
And yeah, we're going to turn over to our Q&A session. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, please do uh, the raising uh, the raised hand emoji or reaction on here, and then we'll be on the lookout for that. Uh, but I guess Tim and I could start it out. You know, Bomani, when, whenever, especially for sports journalists, um, young sports journalists, we see ESPN as like the pinnacle, the top of the top. Um, so can you talk about, uh, do you think that is the top of the top? Should we assess it that way? And um, if you have one, what was your I made it moment? Well, it depends on what you mean by the top of the top. It is absolutely the preeminent brand in sports coverage. It has a very, very, very unique place in the American consciousness. Like I tell people all the time, they talk about my contract like I play for them. I mean, like people, you know what I mean? Like people care about whether our contracts get extended, renewed, all of this stuff. It's really kind of wild and strange, but that's what the game is. Um, and so, yeah, it's the top in that regard. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best place for you at a given point in time. Like you got to understand, I've been I've been hired by this company. I've been fired by this company. I've been hired by this company again. Like I've gone through the back and forth. I've known when it was best for me to be there. I've known when it wasn't best for me to be there. But like all things being held equal, it's still the place to be. But your goal as a person working in this industry should always be about the quality of your work, not where you do that work. So for me, one of the biggest lessons I learned from my time at ESPN was in 2007 when they did not renew my contract. And I had to find some work and figure out what to do. And I started working at a radio station. And it wasn't like, now I'm at this local radio station in Raleigh doing a show on Saturday mornings. I can now dial back how hard I'm working because this is an ESPN. No, I treated that job as though it was ESPN. And so you grind on it. And I was grinding on it with ESPN having not renewed my contract. So I'm thinking I'm never going to go back there. They made their decision about me. And I did some of the most satisfying work of my life after that because the concern was the work. My concern before had been I want to get a job at ESPN. But if you love what you're doing, what you want to where you want to be is wherever the best place is for you to do the work that you want to do. And there's a good chance that will be ESPN. There's also a good chance that at a given point in time, it won't be the place for you. So whenever I meet young people and they're like, yo, I want to work at ESPN. No, 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 no. Don't tell me that. Tell me you want to do the work. Tell me you want to the kind of projects that you want to work on. You want to work at ESPN. Why? The only reason there is to tell people that you worked at ESPN or to be able to say, I work at the top place. But what about you? What about what that place is going to do for you? So there are different points at your career where ESPN, yes, is absolutely the top place for you to go. There's also going to be points in your life or career where you look at ESPN and be like, no, that's not where I need to be right now. Well, Mani, um, I know that, you know, a lot of times, too, uh, sometimes we talk as journalists, we talk about, you know, making sure that we're entertaining our audience and keeping them engaged, but also doing solid reporting. How do you um, find balance in that, especially in a talk show or a podcast setting? Well, I don't think those two things have to be balanced. Um, the core substance is the necessary condition. Uh, the entertaining stuff is the sufficient, right? Like, like at its root, you got to have the foundation to whatever it is that you're doing. What I think when people talk about balance, I think the problem is people believe often that by definition, informing is the opposite of entertaining. And the information comes in the ideas, the information comes in the data, the entertainment comes in the method of presentation. So what you'll want to find are techniques to make your information as digestible, because digestibility is more important than the entertainment. You need something that's easy to consume, that's easy to read, that's easy to watch, that's easy to listen to. And so once you do that, you can then also make it entertaining. Like the example that will make me sound incredibly old, I understand some of the youngsters might not get this, but uh, Schoolhouse Rock, so in the 1970s, you had these kind of interstitial 
things in Saturday programming that would teach with like almost jingles, like music, you know? So it's, um, I can't even remember because they actually outdate me, you know what I mean? But it's like a song about how a bill becomes a law is a great example. Uh, conjunction, junction, what's your function? Explaining what a conjunction is and all of those things. There's no balancing act there. They have the substance and they just put, put it to song. But you start with the substance, you get to the rest of it, but you just want to make sure that it's consumable above all else. And like I said before, if anybody has a question, raise your hand uh, or enter something in the chat as well. Oh, here, here we go. All right. I, I think I saw Dr. Feldner's first, so we'll go. And you. even if it wasn't, you know. You know that I'm the dean. Um, I actually was going to say this earlier, um, but I, there's another Marquette connection that I learned after the fact is Chuck O'Neill, who I believe is yes. working on your show, and is one of our proud alums. And so I have to ask, what's it like working with Chuck O'Neill, a proud Marquette yeah. grad? Yeah, no, I just saw Chuck a couple of days ago when we shot. Chuck's good. Uh, the thing is, Chuck is the director, and with his television uh, production, Basically, the only two irreplaceable parts are the host and the director. So I like to see Chuck a little bit because nobody's really allowed to be around us that much because if we get sick, the whole production shuts down. Uh, no, but Chuck Chuck has been excellent um, in this. He worked for many years as a director with The Daily Show. So we've been it's been great for us to have him uh, working on the show. The team that we got working on the show is honestly, I just look at him like, wow, we got a rack of overqualified people. Like, it's just really fortunate to have him. And Paul, Dr. Uh, yeah, Paul Mark. I'm going to defer to Nancy. Nancy, you first. Well, I was just wondering, I, I love what you said about journalists in general. I mean, that's so important with everything we're seeing at this moment in time as journalists are going down, let's say, a very narrow lane where they could be giving much more perspective and much more of a basis in belief. Which So that's just one little piece that I really appreciate. But I'd love to know, what is your new show offering you that's sort of perfect for right now and what you're thinking? Well, what I got is 30 whole minutes. You know, like that's the that's the thing that I've got now. I got 30 whole minutes and just kind of more tools to put things out there. So with the stuff that I've been doing for the last few years, the tool I really have is my voice. Like, even if you just put me on camera, it's what I'm saying that, you know, that's what we're doing here. And the nature of that content is kind of quick reaction. And so there's obviously clearly a value in that. Um, and I've enjoyed doing it. I'm just now doing something different, right? Where I'm mapping out topics three, four months in advance. So I'm not used to having week, not only weeks to write an essay, but also about a dozen people to get their hands on it as we try to figure out how to make it the best. And I've got like a room of comedy writers where if we want to write a sketch to help illustrate a point, we can do that. Or we want to take an idea that uses real people and figure out how to develop it. Um, like I didn't, it's fun to have like to talk about something. And if you haven't seen the show game theory, I do think you should check it out. It's a pretty good show. Um, and we did our first episode about, like, I knew our first episode was going to be on Selection Sunday. And I was trying to figure out what we would talk about. And I was like, okay, we'll be in the throes of the Coach K retirement tour. Cool. And as someone who grew up hating Duke, I was just kind of like, man, so why is it that I hate Duke so much? And, you know, the, like, elephant in the room is, like, black people, that ain't our squad by and large. Not all of us don't want to be essentialists about this. And you youngsters just won't understand it because it was a different era back in the 1980s. And I was like, but how is it that that's the one school that got picked out? And then I stopped and thought about it. Georgetown, UNLV, Arkansas, the Fab Five, like all the teams that black people loved and felt like they were on. Duke was just beating the brakes off them through the entire end of the 1980s and the early 1990s. Like to watch all your heroes get vanquished and the announcers are cheering them on the whole time and the refs are just giving them all the calls and stuff, man. That's rough. That's really, really rough. And so I was like, okay, we could do an essay on that because it lets us get into like these deeper, there are deeper societal issues and there's basketball history and there's kind of fun in it. And I really love the idea of doing this and knowing there are going to be a lot of white people thinking I was calling them racist when I'm like, no, nah, we just over here hating. No big deal. We just saw you about all this losing, right? Like I thought all that, but we do it. 
and then my exec, one of my executive producers is like, what if we come up with a museum exhibit at a Black History Museum about how Coach K has terrorized Black America? Boom, let's do it. And we rent out a room at a museum and we actually build out the whole exhibit and we take ideas from everybody and we walk real people through the exhibit. And Jalen Rose stops by to give his testimony as someone who was vanquished by Coach K. It was like at once totally absurd, but had like a lot of levels and connections that we that could be made. And it's just hard to do something like that with a quick reaction time. So this format, I'm someone who's intimidated by the idea of writing a book. But if you ask me to write you a column and turn it around in three hours, it doesn't scare me in the least. This for me is like writing books for the first time, like really pouring over and like, oh, it's the best we could do where we're going to tear it to shreds four times. And then this new thing will actually be the best thing that you could do. So that's that's really what it's giving me is it's not it's not giving me any freedom to say things that I couldn't say before. ESPN's always been good about like affirming my ability to express what I thought and also their trust that I'm not wildly irresponsible. And so there's not anything I'm going to say on this show, honestly, that I wouldn't say on ESPN, because if I wouldn't say it on ESPN, I probably wouldn't say it at all. But I have I, I get to play around with this in a different way. And the company's been good about giving me the space to do this show and everything. So I like I think a lot of people think that it's like, oh, you're finally unrestricted. No, I'm just doing a different type of thing for a place that does different types of things. All right. Uh, how about Steven? Or Paul, do you want to go now? I was yeah, about to say, you got Paul all hype and then told him he couldn't go. <laughs> you well, got Manny, Paul. Thanks, for, thanks for being our excellent lecturer. You've had some great observations about sport and society and how they intermingle today where they didn't used to do that so much. So now we have name, image, and likeness where college students can get paid to be themselves and commercials and things of that nature. What's your view of that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I... I think that the name, image, and likeness legislations are a start for player advocates, but for the powers that be an obfuscation of the fact that they still don't pay them. Like, imagine having such a charmed life that your idea of compromise is you can go get a second job. How about that? And that, to me, is ultimately what happened with this. Like, I just watch. The argument always is there's just not enough money to pay the kids. Now, of course, there's all the money to pay everybody else and build all this stuff and everything else. But my issue is they keep coming up with more ways to make more money and somehow they can't find it. Like it's like they talk about finding the money to pay kids almost like people talk about like drug addiction, like you're chasing the purple dragon. You, you saw it that one time and you'll never find it again. And so it just all keeps stacking up and going and going and going. And the players in the end like wind up losing. Um what I think and wonder about with the name, image, and likeness, which is obviously being used by a lot of people as a Trojan horse to like actually pay players. Um, but I've always contended that most of those players on that front are actually not that marketable, not as individuals, perhaps as a whole team, but like an offensive lineman is not really going to be that marketable for most college football teams. But that doesn't change the fact that that offensive lineman is doing incredible damage to his body in order to do this. And the idea is you're only worth getting paid if you're famous is like the worst of modern times, right? The idea that clout determines your value as opposed to whatever the service is that you're you know, actually providing. And so I think it's good for players to receive some measure of compensation, but I still think that it should come from a check with a logo of the university that they work for, just like everybody else that works for those universities. Okay, yeah. How about you now, Stephen? Uh, well, Monty, um, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I wish my brother had lived long enough to know you. Um, he, it would have been a remarkable conversation. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I love what you said about, you know, you, you get in it for the sports or you get in it for, you know, the, the idea of, of, of accomplishing something, but you need to know more than just the sports. You need to know the world in order to make a difference in what this is. And so much of my brother's work uh, was, uh, uh, there are hundreds of, or more illustrations of this, but uh, I wanted to just give a couple of anecdotes about this that would uh, both, you know, highlight my brother a little bit, but also, um, reinforce the, the notion that, that, that you're um, uh, advancing here. So my brother went to the um, 
to the the Munich Olympics to cover the Olympics uh, in in I, I'm going to say 76 and um, 72. 72. I'm sorry. And um, the massacre took place of the Israeli athletes, and his job instantly changed from being a sports reporter to covering one of the most important news events that had ever happened on the planet. And he was boots on the ground, and he um, uh, did tremendous coverage of the event. Um, and then in uh, 80, 80, when we boycotted the Moscow Olympics, he went to cover it as well. And he had the only, well, you know, history will have to tell, but uh, my, my brother did not generally resort to hyperbole. He had the scheduled interview with Brezhnev to discuss the American boycott of the Olympics, but he chose to go visit the Soviet dissidents while being flanked by an entourage of uh, you know KGB people and stuff, and so they at the at the eleventh hour they canceled his interview. But again, just from to reinforce the idea that you're advancing, if you're a journalist, you're a journalist. If sports happens to be the focus that you're on at the moment, be prepared to pivot because the world will will send you different stories that you need to be prepared to deal with and. He was, and so he didn't get the Brezhnev interview. Instead, he wrote the story of the dis dissidents. And Thanks for being here, buddy. No, and thank you for sharing that story. And I think that's just my my parents told me, like when I first got in this, they're like, it's it's more important to know to have something to talk about than know how to write. You can figure that stuff out as it goes. Like the training you're getting is good, but the point being, you got to have something that's behind it, like that undergirds it, that gives you that something fundamental and substantial um and i will also tell you this and you know it ain't necessarily the biggest part of the world or whatever it is but when the world catches on fire it is amazing how my phone my phone also does the same thing it's because those people feel there's a scarcity of people that can speak about the sports and whatever the larger topic happens to be and by the way something can happen there aren't that many buyers in the sports market necessarily for services and if for whatever reason you can't, you might want to be able to get another job too. Just a thought. But also something to keep in mind here, a lot of people have figured out how to parlay being a sports journalist into something else. That's a like a longstanding thing for people to have done at the Washington Post. Um, I think Chelsea Jane is a good example who covered the Washington Nationals and then went to cover the 2020 uh, presidential campaign, for example. Like, so I don't want to I don't want to mislead you and make you think that you can't pick up some things to help you in the larger world in sports. But I'm also pretty sure Chelsea Jane was ready to do that before she started getting in sports. And you might want to be ready for something like that, too. Throwing it over to Jack. Hey, Bomani, it's uh, great to talk to you. I'm a former uh, journalist myself, uh, so I've kind of experienced the grind before coming back here uh, to work at Marquette. And you mentioned just what you kind of have to give up. And and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like for you early on and what kind of got you to, to push through that. So I admit that some of the like the moments of like greatest growth or whatever in my career came from like personal stuff not going so well. So I started writing. My best friend in college died out of nowhere um, in April of my junior year. And my coping mechanism was ordering books off of Amazon. This is when Amazon first started and all they sold was books. And I read this one book and I thought to myself, if this book is critically acclaimed, then I can write. And so I did. Right. And so I just got into it and then just really like it was my focus. I was going I was unhappy in school, but this was like the outlet for me. And so I grinded, I grinded, I grinded on that. Um, I had a big jump that came. I was engaged for a stretch and then we wasn't engaged no more. And then we broke up and then I started doing radio and I just poured, poured, poured into that. Right. Like I, I struggled with balance. I would either be way too hard on the life or way too hard on the work. Like I wasn't so good at the in-between um, of it. But for me, the going through it, man, I've been fired by a lot of people. I've had my pay cut by people. I've had all those things. I've had to move completely off one platform to decide to go try to do another one just because that's what the things were. Um, there's an adaptability that you kind of have to have 
in this. And at least for me, I found that I needed in that. So like I went from writing to doing radio, to doing YouTube stuff, to doing television, to doing podcasts, you know, just all the bounces up and down in this, because to do this for me required being malleable and being flexible, but it also just required a willingness to like put in the hours. Like I met with a woman about 10 years ago and she was in her early twenties at the time and she wanted to get in the sports game, but I think she just wanted to be on TV because I like I didn't know what a journalist fully did until I started doing it myself. Like I didn't understand what the new like the newspaper writer just coming and telling you what happened. I didn't understand like the process, the gathering, you know, all those things that put them in the position to tell us what the things were. And I was sitting there talking to her and she was just explaining to me how basically how it was that she wasn't willing to give up her travel and her weekends. And I was like, you're just gonna have to find another gig. This ain't that. Like, like if that's what you want to do, that's cool. But I was just like, I felt so old when she said it. I was like, wow, traveling weekends, huh? Oh, this new generation. Oh, look at that work ethic. Like, I, you know, I became that person. Um, but it does just take a lot of work. And I do believe while I understand and advocate for more balance in life and think it's good that people are pushing more for their own, you know, and not burning themselves out for these jobs. I do think that you need to understand this job is going to take a lot of work. Like this job I'm doing right now has been far more consuming than I thought it was going to be. Um, but that's what it takes to do something like this. And so you're going to have to take an assessment of, hey, man, this is what it takes to do this. And if you don't want to do that, that's cool. But if you want it, that's the trade. All right. Uh, how about Eric? All right. I've been I've been on. Um, okay. I've been, I'm a sophomore at Marquette, and um, you drop a lot of great gems about what I believe, what to believe in it related to the sports and the sports. And um, when you were talking about um, the Washington Commanders, I was thinking about when this past semester I read um, The Forgotten First by Keish, uh, Keyshawn Johnson about the first African Americans in the NFL, and I was thinking about the the ban for 11 years. I was kind of started by the the Washington Redskins owner, and just talking about just thinking about when you're talking about the Donald Ster Donald Sterling and how when things like that have come about from saying like like the information overload from the internet i'm just kind of wondering what would like how do you think if it's if, if knowing too much is good for us if knowing too much like back then having more people have known like how things were going in the nfl back then if that was like if that was okay compared to now if I, if yeah got you so so what i think is interesting about kind of the comparison um that you're making there is what we knew back then was that black players are not allowed in the nfl even if there was no official edict it was obvious and it was clear that black players were not allowed in the nfl um where it goes to be i think a little different now and just so i can like flush out a little bit better what i mean by knowing too much is i think like social media generally and this is not so much about sports but like when it comes to say celebrities for example we know so much more about the people that like folks used to idolize that it's impossible to idolize them now you can raise the question as to whether or not idolizing them in the first place was ever a good idea but it becomes impossible because you know too much and so with these teams, you've learned enough in these leagues, you've learned enough to know where the hypocrisy comes up, but we don't get any enforcement to try to make the hypocrisy stop, right? Like we're not going to do anything about it. It's almost like we might as well not know, you know? And so that's kind of where it goes from there. But never forget back in the day, they knew what it was. They knew, People knew what was going on. It's just that nobody cared enough to really push it to change. So when you talk about Jackie Robinson, 
signing with the Dodgers in 1945 and integrating the team in 1947, it was the pressure of the black press that made that happen. Uh, Sam Lacey of the Afro-American in Baltimore being one of the chief people that pushed and made that sort of thing happen. But it wasn't because people didn't know there were no black players in the league. It just reached a critical mass point and the decision was made that this change was going to happen. And it allowed baseball, it allowed baseball to make that change. I think, I believe they made it ahead of the military. Like they made that change at the vanguard of society, but it also, because the leagues were so Northern at that point, it also allowed for kind of the continuing otherization of racism in America. Like, look at them down there. They won't even let the blacks play with them. So that way we don't talk about what you're doing up here, right? You just get to point that finger down there. So they knew, we knew enough to know then it just was considered to be okay what they were doing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And no I problem. love highly questionable. So thank you, man. Thank you for that. Thank you, man. We're going to throw it over to John Leuzzi. Hey, Bavani. Uh, thanks for taking the time today. Just wondering what advice you have to um, help stand out. Uh, in internships and early jobs and for us uh, who want to get into this field and hopefully be in a spot you are today uh, with a field and an organization like uh, ESPN? Being, working hard and being dependable. Like that being dependable part goes a lot farther um, than people realize. But like if you're trying to stand out at an internship, initiative is the thing that's going to do it. Like don't be a jerk about it. Don't be annoying necessarily. But you need to be in there like, hey, I want to learn how to do this. Can you help me? Like, that's the thing you want to try to get out of that is learning as many things as you can do in that place. But I want to remind you, hard work is necessary and all this stuff we're talking about wherever you go. Just don't get yourself so caught up with at a high level organization. Do high level work and you'll get to wherever it is that you're supposed to go or that you'll ultimately want to go. But I know. I know for me, when I worked for ESPN for the first time, this is back in 2006, and I set that, this is what I want to do. This is my goal. And it, for me, in that particular group of people that I work with, so this isn't about the whole company, it was a bad fit. And I wound up working for an editor who did incredible damage to my confidence as a writer that honestly, I still, to a degree, am trying to recover from um, somewhat. Cause I was so locked in on, I want to work at the place. Like that was the thing. And the place at the time wasn't where I needed to be. It just wasn't. So I would say the big thing, you, you do the internship, you demonstrate the initiative. And then especially early in your career, you want to work at places that'll make you better. Cause it don't matter if you get to that big place, if you ain't ready for it, you need to work, do the work that will improve your work. And then everything takes care of itself from there. All right, how about um, Demetria? Hello, everybody. Bomani, so good to see you. Hey there, uh, how are <laughs> Good. I know you as a, a fierce competitor and a voracious reader from back in college. So tell us, how do you how do you approach your preparation for your interviews and what would be your first or your favorite interview? So the thing for me about that is it's like the preparation is almost constant. Like I tend to just take in a, as many ideas as I possibly can, wherever they just happen to come from. And then in the end, kind of try to put them together. Um, interviews are tricky for me because now they're just, especially now I do this show. They're like, yo, let's get together and talk about the interview. I was like, I'm just going to sit down and talk to them. We'll work it out from there. You know, like it's going to, for me, it's going to be kind of a rhythm and then go from there. So I feel like with interviews, you want to make sure that you get the important bullet points of whoever the person is you're talking about and a good gauge on what other people have already talked to that person about. So you want to start there and then you kind of want to get under it. And then so so what are these secondary things that you haven't, you know, you've you found out that you want to know about, but you really haven't heard that much about. Um, then you get down to that. Then the next part really comes into a matter of like emotional intelligence. Like, I would say the majority of your questions in an interview need to be coming off of the answer that somebody is giving you, right? Like, what I learned from doing interviews with my buddy Dan Levitard is Dan's asking questions until he gets one that merits a follow-up. And the one that merits the follow-up is the one that ultimately goes somewhere. 
Like that's 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 kind of the the game and approach there. But with the other content, yeah, I just especially with the social stuff, I just wound up. I don't do it as much as I used to, but just take it in, take it in, take it in, and then it all just kind of settles. And it's like, okay, so what have I what have I not seen anybody say that I think is important? And then kind of go from there. Cause ain't no point if me telling you what everybody else has already said, I ain't that good looking. You know what I mean? Like I ain't gonna be able to sell you that far. I gotta give you something you're not getting somewhere else. And I thank you. We're gonna throw it over to Jamie. Well, Mr. Jones, my name is uh, Jamie Robman, assistant professor here. At uh, Marquette, I am from Miami, so I'm used to hearing you on the radio. Um, I have kind of a two part question here. Uh, the first is, you know, you work in an industry that is so complicated from uh, 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 people who look like you sort of vein, right? And I, and I think that sort of you bring a unique perspective in terms of how you present yourself and present knowledge and how you communicate. And I always wondered, was that a struggle for you earlier on? I, I feel like you still have a lot of your identity still in terms of your presentation. Something that you honed on to, is that something that was rejected earlier on? And my second part of the question is, how does that work in terms of working in an environment where you got to work with people like Lebertard in terms of a more culturally diverse sort of uh, environment? Did that create more opportunities to be open or is there still restrictions in that sort of level of professionalization that tends to go along with reporting? I don't know. I ain't never tried to do anything other than be me. Like, I don't know how the counter, like, I haven't felt like people have tried to shut me down or any of, like, I'm, I'm fortunate in the sense that I have a, a literal voice that gets attention. Like, people stop and listen when I start talking and then go from there. People have not really done much trying to mold me out of being who I am. I don't get that stuff that much thought. Like, I find that the people who say, I, you know, I just feel like I can't, you know, be myself in this place haven't actually tried you know like i want to be my full self no 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 that ain't gonna work like as a bunch you're gonna probably need to leave some of that at home don't get me wrong but i haven't had that it's funny though and this tells you a lot about the way that people view the sports industry where you're talking about the environment around dan being culturally diverse no it's not i'm the cultural diversity in dan's environment <laughs> that's why he calls me all the time to talk about the black stuff it just seemed like it because he speaks spanish that you know that all of a sudden that this is something that it that it really isn't um when i go in there yeah i'm bringing the whole thing that's different but no nobody nobody has tried to get me to do this differently they haven't i think part of that though is i do opinion work that is heavily supported in fact i'm you're more than welcome to come tell me why i'm wrong and people don't I've also learned and figured out being inflammatory for its own sake is useless. I don't like, like, the, like you can take pride in, ooh, I made those people so mad. I'm much more concerned with getting those people to listen to me. And so what I've always worked toward is just trying to get those people to listen to me. And I've done well in that regard, but you can look it up, you know, knock on wood. I ain't never been suspended. I ain't never been punished. I ain't never had any of those things happen to me based on things that I've said. It just, it just like people are like, boy, you're so afraid. No, nah, I'm just not stupid. You're so fearless. No, nah, I'm just not stupid. Like I, I, I know how to get these points across to people because again, if your point is to get people to listen to you, you'll probably be fine. If your point is to enrage and inflame, you're probably going to lose. Next, we'll uh, go to uh, journalism professor, Dr. A.J. Wagner. Hey, Bomani, thanks for coming. Uh, I just have a couple questions. Uh, so you're a professional opinion haver, and I think you probably probably address this a little bit. But how how do you how do you keep yourself? Uh, how do you keep the the ideas flowing, right? So maybe it comes from having been a radio DJ and doing two hour programs every day. But how do you keep having interesting takes? Like how do how do you do that? And then the other piece is if you're always presenting ideas and opinions. How do you know where the line is, right? And I think you just said that you, you know, you you never say anything inflammatory. You're just speaking from your heart. But like, how do you know where the line is, right? Because every day you're out here talking, and you know, I, I think it'd be easy to get a get over yourself, right? Uh, but how do you know where the line is where that's too hot, right? Don't even try to get close enough to where that is a question. <laughs> That's the thing for me. I don't know where the line is. I'm not going that far. I've got plenty of compelling stuff to say right here. Because in the end, the game is to wind up being compelling, right? And so how do I come up with the ideas? I really don't have an answer for you, to be honest. Um, they come. I think about it, you know, just kind of go from there. 
Um, but yeah, so for me, it ain't that there's no one thing that I have to say that is just so important that is worth risking the ability to say things for an extended period of time. It's just not it. Like, honestly, the money I'm going to make, I'm, I'm looking for long money, not short. Like you can make some short money off saying something crazy, but the long money comes with respect, right? It comes from people believing in the sincerity of your words and believing in the sincerity of your intentions. And so I play on that line. Like, like when I've gotten in trouble with the company and not even trouble, it's for getting into arguments on Twitter with people who work there, which I firmly believe is really about them being like, please don't, don't beat up the smaller kids. You know what I mean? Cause it's not like, I, I, it's not like I was having, a, I, like I get a call cause I'm having a slug fest. I get a call because I just got through Stomp and Revel, right? Or I get a call because Chris Broussard and I are having a disagreement about the sanctity of chastity. Like, like these are the things that happen, you know, when it comes up. But no, I just don't, I just don't think it's valuable. There's, there's just so many other ways to do it and to make the point. And I feel like people find me entertaining enough that they'll listen to me talk about that stuff like a rational human being instead of like, you know, we've had people that worked at this company and others who like messed up and said that wrong thing, my thought is this. If you have to think twice, then no. Like if there's any second thought, it just ain't worth it. Bomani, I, I had a question. Um, so we're talking about the grind, uh, all this hard work that you have to put in, and especially with you know mental health being at you know such a, a high awareness right now, how are you, if you are prioritizing that, and then how do, you know, how are you doing it? But then as a professional, what are some advice that you would have for, for some of the young journalists coming up? Well, it's kind of hard for me to think about it in the context of the job, because I think about these things now in the context of the pandemic. So when it all locked down, like I started working out five days a week and started doing my yoga, you know, that sort of stuff. And I really, because the TV show I worked on had just gotten canceled. And so I needed to find work to focus on. And I did. And I found things that I wanted to do and other opportunities. Like I was always looking for something that excited me or that I found to be interesting. And I did a lot of different things that I hadn't done. Like I wrote something for Vanity Fair. It was a lot of work. Um, but when that happened, it was time. I, I knew the pandemic was going to be a time for self-improvement. Like I looked at it almost like, I mean, people go to jail for eight months and come out. You know, like, like, like if we're locked. If I got to do a two year bid inside my house, that's not the worst thing in the world. People come, you know, go to jail, come out, read hundred books, you know, like there's, you know, there's all kinds of things that I could do. And so I think the mental health thing really just becomes a matter of what all of you, you know, there's an individualized portion of it. The way for me that I've done it has been just kind of making sure to take care of my body. It was probably the best thing that I've, that I've done. And I, if you're not on this yoga, man, you need to. Yeah, well, uh, uh, thanks so much for uh, for your time, Bomani. It looks like we don't have any more questions, but uh, I know how appreciative everyone is um, of you taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk with us. Uh, I, I appreciate it, and not that I'm inviting you to do it, but I will say this, students, especially to the younger of you, do not in the future miss opportunities to ask questions in things like this. Like the biggest thing that you get out of college really is not the classroom stuff and all that. It's the library, it's the yard, and it's these talks. Like those, those are like, especially for like a school that you go, to. my alma mater is not likely to have somebody like me there. I mean, I did this for free, but they're not likely to have somebody like me there because they don't have the resources to have those things. Like you're, you're probably being afforded at like incredible privilege with some of the people that Marquette is going to be able to bring in. And I'm just telling you, you don't value it in this time, but this is the time in your life just to sit around and think about stuff and to go hear people say interesting and cool things and develop on it. Make sure that in your time at this school that you maximize the opportunities um, and chances that you have in this. And the also last thing I will say is I am very dedicated to Al McGuire remaining the last coach to win a national championship in his final game and then not come back. So if any of you are not rooting against Duke, you're doing it wrong. You're bad Marquette alums or students rather. Like they should, like they kick you out the door for that. I wouldn't even trip on it. North Carolina beat us though. Who's us? Oh no, Marquette. Sorry, I thought you were saying Duke was us. Oh my bad. No, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. North Carolina beat you. Uh, uh, that yeah, that was a competition, and sometimes it works out that way. You know what I'm saying? But uh, if you if you put on the cape for Duke behind that, brother, he was a lost cause to begin with. <laughs>
Well, I'm going to jump in as a Kentucky grad and get on that train with you. Yes. Because um, I just, yes. I was a freshman in college the year of shot heard around the world. So, um, the fun I fact, Kentucky doing... fans hate Duke more than Carolina fans do. It's a little known fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, but I want to add my thanks both to you and we did not pay him for that last comment, but students, I hope you are listening, take advantage of these opportunities and it's, you know, step one was getting here. And when you come back the next time, start, you know, ask your questions, but thanks for everyone for making the time and to Tim and Andrew, you did a great job facilitating for thanks for keeping us going. And I hope everyone uh, enjoys. And again, thanks to the Axon family, the legacy, the tradition, and the family who joined us today. Uh, but it was a great conversation. Thanks.